Good morning. Welcome to Peoria Nazarene. Please rise and sing with us. Nazarene today. Uh, if you're a guest, thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you for those online as well. Can we just, that's such a prayerful song to begin our service, and uh, I think it would be good at the beginning of our service today just to take a moment, um, quiet our hearts, prepare our hearts, ask God to help us prepare our hearts for worship today. Can we do that together? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we take this moment at the beginning of our service just to, uh, I guess, to be aware of the reality of the busyness and of probably some thoughts that are running through our minds and just to invite you to still our hearts uh, through your spirit to prepare us for this time of worship as a church family today. We thank you that your word reminds us that every time we gather in your name, you are here. Uh, the Lord Jesus, our risen Savior, is here through the Holy Spirit. But so much even more than that, our prayer is that, our, that we would be with you. 
think if we're honest, we'd admit that there are times that we know you're here, but our hearts aren't with you. We're just too, maybe our minds and our hearts are thinking about other things. But here today, Jesus, would you speak directly uh, to our hearts? Would you speak to us through this time of, of singing these songs of the faith through opening your word together? And we pray that uh, everything we're doing today is all about deepening our relationship with you. If, if, if what we do today doesn't result in a deeper walk with you, then, then we're clearly missing uh, what you have for us. So I pray that for myself, Lord. I pray that for each and everyone here uh, in the building, uh, this warm building right now, we're thankful for the heat inside, or those who are worshiping from home today. That's the prayer. Jesus, through your spirit, we pray uh, by your grace, would you draw us closer to you? Give us the faith we need to respond. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue worshiping. join me in this reading, please? Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. Thank you. Oh, 
Let's pray together, shall we? Thank you, Lord, that you are the God who pardons our sins today, yesterday, tomorrow, this year, forevermore. Your one sacrifice on the cross is sufficient to pardon all our sins. That's why we gather here to worship you. You are worthy of our worship, our full adoration. And we ask that you would reign in our hearts as the Prince of Peace. Would you reign in our hearts and reign in our households and reign in Peoria, Illinois as the Prince of Peace? We ask that you would establish the kingdom of God here, starting with us. And that's why we're doing a series, Emotionally, Spiritually Healthy. That's what we want to be, Lord, because we want to be fully consecrated to you. We want to be a holy people. And we want to surrender our full selves to you, Lord, our minds and our hearts, our wills, and we want you to be glorified. We ask that your spirit would be filling us up to pursue righteousness and holiness, to bring glory to your name. Lord, we're just so thankful that by the blood of Christ, we are brought near to you and the promise that when we draw near to you, God, you draw near to us. And so throughout this week, just ask that your spirit would be prompting us to draw near to you in prayer. That when we find ourselves starting to do some unhealthy thought patterns, we would surrender our minds to you, Lord. And we would call out to you and cry out to you for help in that moment. Lord, we are are so grateful that you are the good shepherd. You are our warrior shepherd. 
Oh, how we can remain calm for you will fight for us. You fight the battle. You have won the battle already against Satan and against sin. And one day you will return and that victory will be fully consummated with us. The dwelling place of God will be with us. You'll create a new heaven and a a new earth where there'll be no more mourning, no more crying, only rejoicing for you, Jesus. Lord, we're just so thankful that this is a day, this morning, we get to worship you on the Lord's day, the day we recognize that you rose from the dead and you defeated our sin. You were victorious over it all. Lord Jesus, you're our foundation. You're our hope. You are our confidence. We love you, Jesus, because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Uh, For those who don't know me, my name's Sean Link. I'm the associate pastor of Family Ministries here at Peoria Nazarene. And as we continue on in our worship service, I just got a special announcement from the Family Ministries. Our elementary children are beginning a new curriculum. It's called Trackers of Truth. And so in Trackers of Truth, they combine a little combination of farming and time travel to teach our kids the gospel truths found in the Old Testament while pointing them to Jesus and learning how they can apply biblical truth to their lives. I'm really excited about this new series. And with that being said... At the end of the worship service, when you go pick up your elementary children, you're going to be given two cards. You'll be given a a take-home card, and you'll also be getting uh, this Farm Talk podcast card. On the take-home card, there'll be the memory verse and three big questions you can practice with your kids throughout the week. Whenever you do devotional time together, you'll have a take-home card so you can learn what the kids are learning each Sunday at Trackers of Truth. And then you'll also be getting this other card. And in this card, there's, um, I wrote in the line, Peoria Nazarene Church. And so you can actually, parents, you can make a profile on seedbedkids.com. And when you make that profile, there'll be a place where you can put in your church. And when you type in Peoria Nazarene Church, you'll have access to the videos the kids are watching each Sunday. You'll have access to songs. You'll have access to a lot of really great discipleship material. If you need help um, just knowing how to do that, you can always reach out to me um, through email or, or calling me or pulling me aside this morning. But I'll also be posting on our social media, on our Peoria Nazarene Church Children's Ministry page on how exactly to make a profile. But with this, you'll be able to um, also be able to go to the, the Farm Talk podcast. And that podcast, I think, is three to five minutes. And parents, you can listen to that with your kids when you're driving them to a sporting event or in the living room. And that reviews um, the lesson from this past Sunday. So I'm really excited about this new curriculum, Trackers of Truth. And so at this time, I'm going to invite the kids to be dismissed to go with our children's ministry workers um, for the remaining of the service. Thank you, church. Thank you, Pastor Sean, and uh, parents for partnering with us. Uh, uh, I know how committed the church is, and Pastor Sean is to helping us uh, uh, really uh, develop uh, not only just a relationship with Jesus in our life, but to teach our kids to know Jesus, to walk with him. Uh, Just a couple other announcements, Um, and I know that we have a bulletin in person here, but also uh, if if you're not receiving our news blast online, we have a lot of people right now, especially the last couple Sundays, Several people are worshiping from home. There's all kinds of different kinds of sickness, sickness going around. So uh, I, you know, when I've looked at our online attendance recently, it's it, recently it's exponentially been more than in person. So thank you so much for those who are able to make it out. We're so thankful, but we're also praying for those who may not be able to today and, and uh, also uh, excited to welcome you online. But I just wanted to highlight a few things inside of the bulletin. Um, one is, uh, this Sunday will be the last Sunday to pick up your giving statement. If you'd like to do that in person, 
Uh, you can see Steve Vance, our treasurer, following the service at the back of the sanctuary. And then if you're watching from home, no worries. We're going to mail those remaining statements out tomorrow, so you'll be having those uh, coming up here. There are a few things that are happening. Uh, while a lot of our ministries have been directly impacted um, by what's happening, uh, just in terms of sickness that's being spread around and things that are going on in our community, uh, we still have some things that are able to, to move forward. One of those is a game night. Uh, this Friday, January 21st, here in the sanctuary, there's going to be a game night, and this is intergenerationally for people of all ages. Carolyn Vance is, if you know Carolyn and Steve, you know they love games. And some of the best times you can have are sitting at a, a table with them, playing a game, building relationships. So that is available. It's this Friday, 6.30, for people of all ages. Uh, come on out. Uh, bring some snacks to share if you want. But that will be a wonderful time to get to know people in the church Next, we have uh, our, our next Sunday, City on a Hill is going to be here, uh, January 23rd at 10.30 a.m. City on a Hill is one of the traveling groups with Olivet Nazarene University. And uh, our church, Pure Nazarene Church, has invited a number of different groups from Olivet over the years. And we have always been tremendously blessed by their ministry to us. So we're going to be, uh, they're going to be leading our worship on Sunday. We're also going to be giving them more space, so we'll do more songs than normal. Uh, we will continue in our series, but we are very excited about that. Just want to encourage you to be here next Sunday. Invite somebody. If you're at all able to physically be here in the building, we'd love for you to be here in the building. We'll still have a live stream, but you know live music is better live, right? So we'd love for you to be able to make it if you can. Uh, again, thank you so much for just for your uh, walking with us through these days that we're in uh, once again in 2022. Uh, also want to remind you, your connection card, uh, fill that out, any prayer requests you have. When you leave today, we'll have ushers at both of the rear exits to the back of our sanctuary. You can just drop that in the bucket as you go by, but fill that out, uh, any change in information, prayer requests. If you're online, you could comment on the stream, but you also could use our connection card online as well to connect. And again, this is just one way. Uh, we publish my cell phone on the back of our bulletin. You can reach out that way. You can call the office. You can email. Uh, we're here for you and, and would love to help you come alongside you in any way, any way that we can. Today we're going to continue in our series on emotionally healthy spirituality that's based on the resources by Pete Scazzaro and that have been such a blessing to me uh, and I know uh, have been a blessing to many, uh, and perhaps some of you as well. In fact, one person following the service last Sunday came up to me and said, I'm so glad you're doing this, and we're doing this as a church. This helped me in one of my relationships that I was dealing with a few years ago. So that's our prayer, is that this resource, this initiative, would be an opportunity for all of us to grow closer to Jesus. I mentioned last week, 2021... <laughs> We spent a lot of time waiting, uh, maybe waiting for things to go back to normal, thinking that they would, and then here we are in 2022, and, and I think that if the Lord's challenging me anything in my heart that I believe also he could be using to challenge you as a church family is let's not just sit back and, look, and wait. Let's do what we know we can do, and what is that? It's to cultivate a deeper relationship with Jesus. I was talking to somebody who's a mentor recently. And I just kind of talking about like, oh, man, you know, you know, here we are. And there's a little bit of sickness going around in January again. Or we're, we're dealing with some things that we thought maybe we wouldn't be dealing with. And, um, that, and I was talking about, boy, I just need clarity from God. And the person said, they said, you know how you receive clarity from God? Just spend time with him. And it was one of those like, oh, well, of course I know that, right? But how true is it? I don't know what's on your heart. I don't know what relational challenge. I don't know perhaps a medical challenge. Perhaps something is hitting you hard. And while there isn't the importance of searching things out and trying to figure things out, sometimes it can distract us to where we become so hurried in our heart, we don't slow down. We just be with Jesus. It's amazing when we spend time with Jesus. So many times, you know, even though he's able, sometimes he does deliver us from the storm right away, but... A lot of times he changes our mindset and he fills our heart with his peace to endure the storm that we're in. And so that's really our hope and prayer. I wanted to begin with a quote today. Um, and this is a quote. Uh, it's actually from a long time ago by Augustine in his book, The Confessions. This is around AD 400. Listen to what he says. He says, how can you draw close to God 
when you are far from your own self. Grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. How can you draw close to God if you're far away from your own self? It's kind of the theme we're going to be talking about today. I don't know if when you were in high school, some, we have some teens here as well, but perhaps somebody has said to you, or when you were in high school, they said this phrase to you, just be yourself. You need to learn to, you may ever have somebody tell you that, be yourself. It's so important that you learn to be yourself. That used to kind of frustrate me, especially when I was in junior high. I don't really know who I am. I had size 12 shoes, I was getting big feet, and I was really short and husky jeans, and I'm just trying to figure out who am I right now. I don't know who Mark McCall is. And so we hear that, you just need to be yourself, and sometimes that can be frustrating. But then behind that is a desire. It's a desire to be led by confidence and love. It's a desire to be the person that God created you to be. It's a desire to walk with God in a way that isn't bound by all the fears, fears of what people think, fears of failure and all the different pressures that we feel. And we can think of examples of knowing yourself and living out of that true self. And uh, one, one example, I know we're coming up on March Madness. Uh, some of you are huge NCAA uh, basketball fans. I'm looking at one of you now. Uh, and, and this is a time of year you just can't wait. You just can't wait to turn on the TV and get lost, fill out your bracket and all of that. But we love the stories of the underdogs, don't we? And, and you could go back through, through years and previous tournaments, and one of the most recent that we think of is Loyola University of Chicago, the Loyola Ramblers, and, and how they made a run, and they were such an underdog. But I was reading one, one report that said about them is they knew how to play their game. They knew they couldn't play the game that Kentucky plays or the game that another powerhouse basketball team, but they knew how to play their basketball. They knew how to work together and they were really good at being themselves and playing to that strength. Because of that, they could beat much larger teams. Tomorrow is uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. You can think of an individual like Rosa Parks, 1955. A 42-year-old African-American seamstress riding in a bus in Montgomery, Alabama and, and taking a stand. Uh, she violated segregation laws by refusing to give up her seat to a white passenger. She faced seemingly insurmountable odds, laws in the government, even the culture, yet she took a stand against racism, in her instance, by sitting on the bus. Her action became the spark, as we know, that ignited a movement led by Martin Luther King Jr. We can see the strength, the confidence of this seemingly insignificant lady who took a stand and her willingness to stand alone against pressures that seem insurmountable. They remind us of one of the characters we're going to look at in the Bible today, King David. King David, that shepherd boy who God used to stand against seemingly insurmountable odds. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 17, 26 through 45. I have sermon notes you can use and jot down some notes and some discipleship questions on the back if you'd like to use those uh, just in your family and perhaps a, in a small group or discipling relationship. But I want to just tell you a little bit of background before we read our passage for this morning. If you're not familiar with the story, this is one of those stories that uh, many people, even if you're not familiar and haven't read the Bible, you've heard of David and Goliath. It's one of the, if not the most well-known stories in Scripture. And so I just want to tell you a little bit about that background. Saul is one of the characters we first meet in the story, anointed king of Israel. He is the first king of Israel. Remember we saw last week he stood head and shoulders above the other men. So he's a man who is obviously very tall. Uh, he looked like a king should look. And even though he initially succeeded as king with a triumphant victory over the Ammonites, so a wonderful military victory, he did not trust the Lord fully. He cared more about what other people thought. He was wise in his own eyes, and he did not fully obey the Lord because he did not, from deep within his heart, beneath the surface, trust in the Lord his God. He was so preoccupied 
with the pressures of being king, with, with pleasing other people, with doing what was right in the eyes of his culture. Because of this and the fact that he rejected God, God rejected Saul as king of Israel. And at, at that crucial turning point where God speaks to Saul through the prophet about this rejection, how God is taking the kingdom away from Saul, from that point forward, Saul really is powerless. And that's where our story kind of picks up today. There's a confrontation that takes place in the Valley of Elah. In this valley, you can see uh, where the Philistine army on one side of the mountain, and then on the other side of the valley, we have the, the Israelite army squaring off for battle. Uh, troops aligning, camped on either sides of this valley. A confrontation takes place, and they're stuck. Uh, and Saul is powerless in this situation. Here in the story, we're told that during this time of encampment, there is a warrior named Goliath, a, 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 a man of battle, a hardened veteran who stands to oppose the people of Israel. And he challenges a person, a leading warrior, from Israel to a duel. So this is kind of like a mano y mano. This is a, a duel where the two would go against each other and whichever one would lose and was defeated in this one-on-one -on -one battle, his people would become servants of the other nation. So what do we know about Goliath in this story? We could paint a picture of him and it's, and it's, really, it's really quite impressive. We know that he is a hardened military veteran. He, this is what he's done his whole life. He is very, very skilled, the most skilled in the Philistine army. We know he's very tall. The English translation says nine feet tall, which may have been the case, but we know that the Greek translations in the New Testament uh, and the Dead Sea Scrolls say that he was six feet nine inches tall. So we really don't know how tall he was, but the bottom line is he was very, very tall. So you get the point? Very tall. Not only was he tall, he was very, very strong. In fact, we read about the, the armor that he wears, a bronze helmet, a coat of mail. So his armor weighed 125 pounds. How many of you guys can bench 125 pounds? I'm not going to ask you to. Some of you be like, yeah. Some of you like, I don't know. He wore 125 pounds. This is how strong he was. Bronze leg armor. He was very dangerous. Not only was he very tall, very strong, he was very, very dangerous. He carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. And we're told that the shaft of his spear was heavy, and it was thick, and it was tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. And he had an armor bearer who walked ahead of him carrying a shield. So this is one very, very hardened military veteran. And on top of this, he was confident. He was arrogant. And his confidence was in his success. He has triumphed. He's still standing. Nobody who, to this point, stood against Goliath walked away to tell the story. He was a champion. And the people of Israel and Saul were terrified. They trembled. In fact, in this chapter, we read that they tremble with fear, and they're deeply shaken. And Goliath comes every day and every night for 40 days he stands on his side and he walks out of the encampment and he taunts the people of Israel and he taunts their God. And for 40 days, morning and night, you can count on it, Goliath is going to come and yell out and boast and, and once again offer his challenge and then to make a mock of the people of Israel. Well, then we meet David in this chapter. David, what do we know about David? Let me put it this way. He is the opposite of Goliath. He's the opposite of Goliath. He's probably, we don't know for sure, but he's, most scholars believe, probably 17 years old here. So he's a youth. He's the youngest of the eight sons of Jesse. And he has a menial task. So what is he doing in this story is, in this story, he's coming, doing the menial task of delivering rations for the soldiers, bringing food, bringing drink checking for his father on his older three brothers who serve in King Saul's army. And we know that he is a shepherd. And we know that in order to come and check, uh, here the passage tells us, on his brothers and bring rations, he has to find somebody to take care of the sheep. He's a shepherd youth. He has no military experience. 
He has no hardened veteran experience like Goliath. And for 40 days, the taunting goes on. And David, at one point, at the end of this period, he hears the taunting. And uh, before I read our passage today, King Saul is so desperate here. He's so desperate that he offers a reward. It's a great reward. No more taxes. You think the government would ever say that today for a reward? This is a, this shows how desperate they are. No more taxes. If you'll come and fight, if you come and defeat Goliath in this mano a mano match, no more taxes for the rest of your life. And I'll even give you my daughter, he says. This is how desperate and how terrified Saul is and the people of Israel are. No one steps forward with that offer. Nobody. Enter David into the scene. I want to invite you to pick up the story in verse 26. And we're going to read through verse 51. You can follow along on the screen or in your Bible. Starting in verse 26, David asked the soldiers standing nearby. This is after David comes to visit. He's bringing the rations. And he says, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And these men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. What have I done now, David replied. I was only asking a question. He walked over to some others and asked them the same thing and received the same answer. Then David's question was reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. Once again, reminding us how desperate King Saul is, that anybody who will come, he'll listen to. Let's continue reading. Verse 32. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I will do it again to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag, then armed with only his shepherd's staff in a sling. He started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at his ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog? He roared at David. That you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come on over here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied today. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. Wow. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with a sword and spear. 
This is the Lord's battle, and he will give it, he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and he hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and they ran in total terror. What an amazing story. What an amazing story this is today. Do you see David in this story? He knows himself because he knows the one and true God, the one true living God. Saul is trapped. Saul is trapped in his own fear. Saul has forgotten who God is. Saul is unable to lead the people. David knows himself, and he knows who the one true God is. And this is the main point I want to share with you today. You can become the person you are created to be by deeply knowing and trusting in your creator. This is so important. And I wish somebody would have told me this even earlier in my life when they were telling me, be yourself, be yourself. Well, who am I? It's impossible to really become the person that God creates you and me to be, the unique person that he created us to be independent of a relationship of deeply knowing God, your creator. You see, self-deception is a very, very real thing. One of the greatest things now that I'm a parent I want to keep my kids from is the lies, that, the lies of sin, the lies of the world that tell you that, that power is where fulfillment comes from, that lust, that greed, that taking advantage of other people to get ahead is what matters. There's so many lies our world tells us. Immediate gratification is better than, de than, than the, the delay that comes from hard work towards something. There's so many lies in our world, and if we're honest, we all have believed them, and we become to believe things about us that aren't true. You see, you can only really become the person God created you to be in the context of a deep, committed relationship where you know God and you trust in him as your creator. And that's my greatest prayer for you. I want to describe today a heart that deeply knows and trusts God. What does this look like? As we look at this story and we begin to under, uh, unpack what's underneath the surface here, I believe we have a picture of a heart that deeply knows and trusts in God. What do we see in this story? Number one, a heart that deeply knows and trusts God will overcome any obstacle in the way of God's will. We see this in this story. There are so many obstacles that David faces. In fact, you could probably find more, but I found a few. We, I mean, and we could literally have a list quite long, but I'm going to start with the obstacle of family. David has this faith in God, but did you catch the response of his family? I mean, here he comes. He's the youngest of the boys. He comes all the way to deliver rations. Did you catch his oldest brother when he yelled out in anger at David, what are you doing here? You're just a shepherd boy. Why don't you go back to the few sheep? You're a zero. What are you doing here? God can't use you. Why are you here? Do you hear those voices? Perhaps there's voices in your life. Sometimes the voices that hurt the most are our family member who said something so hurtful. Maybe they didn't mean to. Maybe they love you, but they said some things that just affect who you are and what you believe about yourself. David could have taken that to heart. You're right. What in the world am I doing here? I should shut up, hand over the cheese and bread, and I should turn around and go home. You're right. And then I'm embarrassed. His brother's saying this publicly. Mocking him. See the obstacle of uh, verse 26, you could look at that of the family. There's an obstacle of seemingly insignificance. This is Goliath. He is a hardened veteran. He is equipped. David is just a boy who's a shepherd. There's no significance you can bring to the table. This is an obstacle here. 
that could be in the way we would look at God's will for David. There's another obstacle, and this one hits close to home. It's the obstacle of comparison. The obstacle of comparison. There's so many ways David could compare himself. Number one, Saul. Now, David's been anointed at this point to be king. David knows that he's been selected by God uh, to be king, not yet publicly revealed. But, but, but David doesn't look like a king. He doesn't have the stature of Saul. In fact, the irony of this story is, if you go back to chapter 14, when, when um, Saul is anointed king, he stands head and shoulders above the crowd. We don't know his height, but arguably he's closer and maybe closest in the nation to the stature of Goliath. And, and not only that, the, the parallels are striking between the armor of Saul and the armor of Goliath. Saul has the, the coat of mail. Saul has the same armor as Goliath. But Saul lacks the confidence in God to confront the enemy because Saul has rebelled against God. Saul is not trusting in God. So David could have faced this reality. Well, look at King Saul. I mean, I'm nothing. And even King Saul, what are you doing? He even laughs. It's almost there's this, this mocking, well, and may the God of Israel help you. I think there's a lot of sarcasm there. It's like, well, you're going to need it. <laughs> Good luck. May the Lord help you. I mean, there, there's not a lot of confidence that Saul places. And these are all obstacles of comparison. Goliath could have compared himself not only to King Saul, but what about, or excuse me, David not only compared himself to King Saul, but what about Goliath? He's a man of war. I'm a shepherd boy. These are just some of the obstacles here. Obstacles of family that's putting him down. Obstacles of feeling insignificant, of comparison, and I'm sure we could find more. But because David deeply knows God and his trust is in him, there is no obstacle that can overcome David. His eyes aren't on what other people say about him. His eyes aren't on the comparisons. One of the hardest things for me to do at times, especially in my youth, my 20s, was comparison. I really struggled with that. Like, am I doing good enough? Am I doing good enough at my career? Am I doing good enough here? And so many times we get caught in this trap of comparing ourselves, wanting to make sure we measure up to other people's standards. Fear often motivates us that way. And it is a good motivator in some ways. We're very competitive, we very, but it's not ultimately the best motivator that we can have in our lives. But let me tell you, it's so much better to deeply know and trust in God. There is a calm, there is a confidence when we, when we place our trust in God that gives us the ability to overcome obstacles that may stand in the way, potential obstacles for God's will. So a heart that deeply knows and trusts in God will overcome any obstacle in the way of God's will. Secondly, will find and live its true self in relationship with God. This is really striking in, in this story. David knows God. What, when the whole nation is terrified and just shaking because of the threats of Goliath, unable to see and remember who their God is, David knows God, and he is full of confidence in God. And what's fascinating about David is he's not concerned about making a name for himself. He's not trying to prove anything. And how many times when we do stuff do we want to prove something? We want to make a name for ourselves. But David in this story, you cannot miss it. He has little concern about what other people think about him. And he is very concerned about God's name. He's concerned about what other people think about his God. And he wants the name of his God to be lifted up. And when Philistine is mocking his God every day, David, the zeal in David, is not for his own name. It's not so that he can become the hero and he can do, not so that he can get the reward. It's because he cares about the name of God. And because this is his priority, David is able to stand out and he's able to stand alone. Because his commitment to God and his love for God is greater than anything or 
anyone else in his life. You see the strength there? I propose to you that if our love for God is less than our desire to be loved by people, if our belief in God's love for us is less than our desire to be successful, we're going to respond the same way that the people of Israel do to the challenges in our way. But when our confidence comes from our love of God and this deep sense of knowing who we are, it's like David here. He can see the hand of God guiding and leading him through a seemingly menial past. He's interpreting his past, his sense of self, through the lens of his relationship with God. Did you catch that? Like, like he doesn't just look back and say, you know, I had this one time where I was protecting the sheep and I got lucky once or twice. Man, it was a close one. You should have been there. No. He says, look, God was guiding me when no one else was watching, when no one else cared. I'm the youngest. And and when a lion would come or a bear with a club in my arm, I'd grab its jaw. So he has some physical strength here. He's got some skill here. But even in his strength and his skill, he says, it's the Lord who delivers me. You see, David's perspective is that all he is comes from God. And his sense of confidence that is motivating him today, it's not this arrogant self-confidence. It's that he understands himself in relationship with God. We're also told he is very skilled with the sling. So it's really amazing. I, I did some reading a long time ago, and I actually I remember I made a sling. This is when I was like a teenager. And I made like a legitimate sling like he would have had, not your pullback one. And I remember taking that and, and whirling it and letting go of one side of the string. And it, it, it was terribly inaccurate. But the more and more I did it, I was getting more and more accurate. Um, I can compare it to traditional archery. I, I've been trying to pick up traditional archery. My dad was a traditional archer. So he hunted with long bows and recurves and no sights, no pulleys, just a simple uh, a branch or basically a, a, what they call a stave, usually from Osage, that they fashion into a bow. And my dad was so skilled with the bow without sights, just instinct. He could pull back and he could hit a target about the size of an apple repeatedly. And so just the ability, we think about that. And here David is using a weapon of his time, many, many days probably out there defending the sheep, maybe passing time, practicing with the sling. And David has become very, very accurate here. So I don't want to diminish the fact he is prepared. This is something he's done. But even in his preparation, which is part of his confidence, his ultimate confidence isn't in his weapon or in his preparation. It's in the Lord his God. You see, David has a sense of self where he believes God can use those things of the past. Do you believe that? You see, if you don't have, if if your sense of self isn't ultimately defined if, or being defined in a relationship with God where you really know him and you're trusting in him and you're looking to him to define who you are, we can look back at the things of the past and they can become so defeating. They can become so demoralizing. The hurts, the pains, and we can find ourselves in a place that we just can't seemingly move forward. But when God is our God and we trust in him, as our creator, and we believe that what happened in the past didn't just happen, that he was there, even our failures, even our sins. And as he redeems us, and as we trust in him, we begin to see that perhaps those pains and wounds of the past that I'd much rather pretend didn't happen, but when I look back and I see those, I believe, as I trust in God, that he can use those things in my current challenges even now. Do you see this sense? David knows himself. Because he knows God. He has this confidence. And he honors the name of God, not his own. Because of that, we're told, God gives David the victory. Because David is trusting in the one true God. The final way that we can see a heart that deeply knows and trusts God, a characteristic of that, a heart that deeply knows and trusts God, will bless its family and community. Now, this isn't as explicit in the story, but it's there. David's faith. It's really not just about David's faith, but about God and and his power and his ability, but because David trusts in God and David's willing, and he lives out of this sense of, of fully knowing and trusting in God, 
David's action and the victory that God brings through his faith for David becomes a blessing to God's people. And we see this, that the whole military goes and this long siege, this back and forth stalemate, if you will, that's been going on. Now there's this overwhelming victory. And as you unfold the story of David, it's not just, you know, you look at each chapter, there's good chapters, there's bad chapters, there's hurt, there's loss, there's his own sin. But when we look at David's story, and we, and we remember King David, the primary descriptor that God gives us for him is that he is a king who is after God's own heart, a man after God's own heart. And not just the blessing that David was to his family, to his nation, but even today, still, if you think of uh, not only, of course, Jesus coming, but we think specifically of the Psalms. Think of the Psalms. Think of the treasures we have in the book of Psalms, prayers that come from David's deep knowledge and trust in the Lord. And even to this day, the church is still being blessed, not just the church. I can't tell you how many times at a funeral I've read Psalm 23. I can't even begin to tell you how many times. And I've watched families, Christian families, and families who don't have faith but are familiar and I've watched the comfort and the hope that Psalm 23 brings. You see, when you make it your priority to deeply know and trust God a, from the heart, not only do you have the grace to overcome every obstacle, not only are you able to, to live and become the person God's created you to be, but you also become a blessing, a blessing to your family. I think we all want to be that, don't we? <laughs> Sometimes we're not that, right? <laughs> Sometimes I'm not that. I fall short. But I'm so thankful today I can remember. Most important thing I can do, lean in, develop this deep knowledge of God, trust him in the heart. I'm using the phrase in the heart for a reason. It's, it's much deeper than just coming and, yeah, I know God, checking a box. It's when God becomes your very center. He becomes everything. The Lord Jesus trusting in him becomes the most important thing in your life, you can become the person you are created to be by deeply knowing and trusting in God, your creator. I hope today that perhaps you've been, you know, if, if you're in a position where you find yourself, you've been trying to figure the answer out to that. Maybe you know who you are, but who am I supposed to be in this new season of my life? Life, life does not let us get comfortable, does it? It was easy to be me when I was a kid, no responsibility, right? Well, then I was the college me and all the pressures, the stresses, and then you enter into the 20s and then the, and then the 30s, and if you get married and have kids, then you're trying to figure out, how do I be that? And then some of you go through the process of you've been through it, your kid's leaving home, and now you're like, boy, who am I trying to be this person? Now I'm trying to be middle-aged. Now I'm trying to be a senior adult. And that's not always easy. But if we put our eyes back on what we know, and that is that there is only life found in a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus. The other things may never make sense, all the questions of life, but there's something deep within our heart that we experience. There's this sense where we can become that person, you and I, that God has created us to be by knowing him and trusting in him. God invites us to find our true self in relationship with him, and only then can we overcome the obstacles that we face. Only then can we find our true self and live as a blessing to our family, our friends, and our community. If your identity is found primarily in any other thing, any other practice, any other person, then knowing God, you will not live up to the person God has created you to be. But the good news is we can respond in faith. We can respond in faith and renew our trust in him. I thought to do that today, uh, I'd invite you to read along with me Psalm 27. I'm actually going to invite you to stand with me. This is one of the psalms that has been one of my favorites my whole life. This is a psalm of David. This is a psalm that David writes from his heart, out of his knowledge of God, out of his deep trust in God, and I don't want you just to read this to read it. I, I, it. I know how easy that is, and I do it all the time. 
but I want you to read this as it was intended to be read. The reason we have this psalm is because God has given us his word. This is God's inspired word through David for you and I. Because we're not just meant to go, wow, David was great. Well, you know, man, I stink. <laughs> you know, like, you know, sometimes we can do that. Or we go, boy, he's great. Or, you know, I wish I could be like that. No, this, the whole goal of what God has done in giving us his word is he wants a relationship with us. He's vi- inviting us in. And so if you're not a Christian today, and if you don't know what it means to have a relationship with God, to trust in his son, Jesus, to have your sins forgiven, you can. And this psalm is a great way for you to see, and even from your heart to cry out to him and to see what it is that God desires. But I also want to speak to Christians. I've been following Jesus a long time. But sometimes my doing gets ahead of my being. I get so busy, but God calls me back to being. This is a psalm of being. This is a psalm that can guide you in any obstacle, any challenge you're facing, and give you strength and hope. I just have to find it in my notes first. It's a little small on the screen. I'm going to turn this way. Let's read this together. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger. So why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. For he will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. Then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. At his sanctuary, I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy, singing and praising the Lord with music. Hear me as I pray, O Lord. Be merciful and answer me. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. Do not turn your back on me. Do not reject your servant in anger. You have always been my helper. Don't leave me now. Don't abandon me, O God of my salvation. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. Teach me how to live, O Lord. Lead me along the right path for my enemies are waiting for me. Do not let me fall into their hands, for they accuse me of things I've never done. With every breath they threaten me with violence. Yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, Wait patiently for the Lord. Can we say verse 14 one more time? Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. Your word is truth. Father, as we read and as we say this prayer together that we have received from King David, we can see very clearly that he was a man, a human being like we are. He was afraid. He was concerned. He was overwhelmed. But he said, my refuge is the Lord. He said that I hear the voice of the Lord calling me, come and talk with me. And my heart says, I'm coming. And Father, today, we believe that that voice is still still speaking today, the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of God that doesn't just call David, but calls us. And here today, Lord, perhaps the 
the Goliaths, the giants, the, the, the fears, the questions, the things that are weighing on us, our own hurriedness are keeping us from hearing your voice. But today we hear, today we hear you calling us, come, come talk with me, because you are the source of life. You are the source of everything we need, and it's impossible to know who we're supposed to be and who you're creating us to be without knowing and trusting in God, our creator. So by your grace today, we turn to you. Like David, we say, here I am, Lord, I'm coming to you. I'm here with you. Father, would you lead us? Would you give us faith? Would you give us the grace this week? While there may be a lot we can't know, and there may be things that we're still figuring out, help us to do to this week what we know we can do, and that is to cultivate a deeper relationship with you. So help us to carve out time, to carve out time to just be with Jesus, because your presence is life-giving. Your word is is sweeter than honey. You direct us, you lead us, so we pray in Jesus' name this week, renew the hunger in our heart. Renew the joy of that. It is such a joy in the midst of the storm or whatever, if we're having a great day or if we're not, it's such a joy to pause and draw near to the God who loves us. There's no other person like you. There's no other friend like Jesus who understands us and loves us with perfect love. Even those closest to us, as David said, our fathers and our mothers, they ultimately have to forsake us because they don't live forever, even if they're good or not. But you are always there, every season of our life. So, Father, meet with us today. Meet with us each day. Help us as we walk with you to experience your, your leadership in a way that we, too, can stand we too can believe. We too, like David, can seek to honor your name and stand up to honor your name, to share your love to all people so that we might become a blessing, a growing blessing to our family and to our community, especially our community that desperately needs Jesus. We love you so much. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the grace that you give today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this song. Oh
my strength, you're my defender, you're my refuge in the storm. Through these trials, you've always been faithful, you bring healing to my soul, I am not alone. truth of that song? Maybe that's just what you needed to hear today. I am not alone. See, when you're with Jesus, what a difference it makes. The hope it gives, the confidence he gives. We are not alone. He is with us. As we prepare to go, I just want to remind you that there are some next steps that you can do um, to deepen your relationship with Jesus. I have these three um, things that we've been calling our whole church to. These are three initiatives, three commitments. Uh, during this time that uh, we can grow closer to Jesus. Number one, carve out time to be with him. I hope this isn't the only time you're with Jesus. Uh, sometimes, uh, that's been true of my life before. I had a busy week, and I needed Sunday because I needed to hit reset, and I needed, to, I needed to commit again to walk with Jesus, to spend more time with him. And if that's the case for you, Jesus still wants to hear from you. He wants you to recommit this week. So we have something available for you. Uh, we're into week two this week, but even if you missed out, I hope before you leave, pick up this devotional, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, day by day. The church is providing this at no cost to you. Uh, if you're online, you can go onto Amazon, and if you have Prime, you can get the Kindle version for free. Uh, or we had a number of people come by in the week, pick up books. We gave away every book we have, so we bought more. And so feel free if you're online to stop by. But this has been a blessing to me. I've done it every day this week. It's Monday through Friday. It's called the Daily Office, time with God uh, in the morning and the evening. So I hope that this is blessing you. I hope that as you spend time with God, this little resource can help you. If you don't know how to, this is a great way. It really walks you through it. Then secondly, connect with somebody this week for discipleship. Um, this is something you could do uh, with your uh, spouse you could do it with a brother, a sister, a parent, your family. You could do it with a small group. I'd encourage you as you develop relationships in the church. We've got some, just some questions that you could use to kind of talk, but, but encourage each other. Pray for each other. Love each other. That's what discipleship is all about. When somebody's down, listen to them. Empathize with them. And then love them and pray for them. What hope we have in that. And then we want to challenge you again to keep Let's keep gathering in this series as we seek to grow deeper in our relationship with Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you this week. Walk with him. Know that you're loved by him, and you are dismissed. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless you.